Well, good morning, Eagle Heights. I want to be one of the first ones to wish you a very Merry Christmas uh, as we start this incredible Christmas season. I, I got to tell you, Christmas is without a doubt one of my favorite seasons of all times. There's so many things that make Christmas so unique, uh, and, and it makes it different than any other holiday. Uh, and we can start listening. One of my favorites, though, is, is, is decorating. Uh, my wife is an incredible decorator. Uh, she makes our home so festive. Uh, it, it is beautiful, the detail she goes into with every little thing telling a story about the birth of Christ or, or pointing to some element of Scripture. or It's just so, it, you just walk in and it, it just makes the season so festive. Uh, and like you, uh, probably this weekend, we got all our decorations down and started decorating at that point. Uh, it just makes it so much sweeter. Uh, there's a lot of other things that make Christmas unique. The parties we go to, the performances we attend, the, the gifts we give. All of that is just so special. But there is one thing that is unique to Christmas that is that no other holiday actually has. Uh, the only one close is Easter, but <clears throat> music is a key part of Christmas, unlike any other holiday. Matter of fact, if you grew up in the Oklahoma City area, and how many of you grew up in Oklahoma City? So I've been in Oklahoma City my whole life. A lot of you, some of you haven't. When you were a child, there was a song that played that let you know it was Christmas. I was walking through the house. I remember this as a child. Walking through the house, and I hear it. Jewelry is the gift to give. It's the gift that'll live and live. So give the gift you know can't fail at They should give us a promo for that right there. I remember going in this Christmas when we moved here. You guys got, we moved here uh, 16 years ago. And our boys were not raised in Oklahoma City, even though Christy and I were. They grew up in Northeast Oklahoma, and we moved right at Christmas time. Matter of fact, I think in a week, what is the date? Uh, in about 10 days, uh, no, it's more than that, about two weeks is our uh, 16th anniversary here. And the first thing Christy wanted was, since we're moving at Christmas, she wanted Christmas to be special. So we get the bedroom set up, and she immediately starts decorating for Christmas because she doesn't want that. To, she wants the boys to be able to adjust to the move and enjoy Christmas. And we're decorating, <clears throat> and as we're decorating, the B.C. Clark jingle comes on. And Christy and I go, it's Christmas, it's Christmas. And our boys are looking at us like we're stupid, like we're crazy. There was no B.C. Clark jingle in Tulsa. They didn't grow up with that. We're looking and we're trying to explain to them, going, listen, when we were kids, this is how we knew it's Christmas. And I'll never hear my older son. He goes, yeah, that's a way. But there's also this thing called a calendar that tells you it's Christmas. Trying to explain the significance of this song to someone that's never been there. Listen, I'm 55. It came on this weekend, and I'm like, it's Christmas! I mean, literally, it gets you there. Christmas music is such a powerful thing. It has united every single genre of music. There's no other, there's no other season, no other theme of music that has brought rock, country, jazz, Christian all together. Matter of fact, if you talk to any young adults from the 70s and ask them their favorite Christmas album, they're going to say one of three, and usually in that three, there's one name that always pops up, Elvis Presley. You're going to say Presley, it's Elvis. Elvis Christmas was a big deal. I never liked it. We never listened to it. But I got friends of mine whose parents lived on Elvis Christmas. There's also Bing Crosby and some other crazy people. But there's all these people brought together because of music. Matter of fact, uh, we see that it's a theme in even Christmas movies. Christmas movies. In Elf, it was music that saved Christmas. The fastest way to bring Christmas cheer is to sing loud. Yeah, the kids all got that one. For all to hear, music is a powerful, powerful medium and is a key part of Christmas. But we got to ask ourselves a question where did it all begin? All this focus on music, all this focus on this unity, this joy, all this stuff, where did it all start? Well, look with me in, in Luke chapter one, and, and let's see where it all started, because believe it or not, we're going to find out today where the music of Christmas actually comes from. At that time, verse 39, Mary got ready. Now, Mary has found out she's expecting. 
Uh, she is leaving to go stay with her cousin, Elizabeth. Remember Zechariah, we talked about at the beginning of the service, the priest who was past the age of having children, finds out his children. Well, Elizabeth, his wife, is Mary's cousin. And they're both expecting babies at the same time. Mary's expecting John the Baptist, the baptizer, the forerunner. And Mary, or Elizabeth's expecting him. Mary's expecting Jesus, the Messiah. <clears throat> Mary got ready, hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home, and she greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. Elizabeth was filled with a spirit, and in a loud voice, she exclaims, Blessed are young, are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Believe it or not, those few verses are the very first song of Christmas. They're they're the first of five that come in Scripture. It's the very first Christmas song. Even though she's not singing it, it's written in the form of a song with with rhyme and meter and time. It's all written in a way that it's put the music if it wished to be. It could fit in the book of Psalms, the book of songs, if we wanted to put it there. But here she is singing the first of these five that come from Christmas. But I want you to see who initiated it. As the points come up, this is the very first song of Christmas. But notice who initiated it. It's initiated by the Holy Spirit. It is initiated by the Holy Spirit. Notice where Christmas music came from. God. God's the one who started Christmas music. Now, notice what's taking place. She walks into Mary's, or Mary walks into Elizabeth's home. Both are carrying children. Both are carrying children that have been prophesied about. John the Baptist, the forerunner, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. As the moment they walk in, the baby inside of Elizabeth jumps, it leaps. Matter of fact, she describes it in her song as leaping for joy. Now, you need to stop right there and understand something. The forerunner's job means this, that he's coming before the Lord. He's making a way for the Lord. He's declaring the arrival of the Lord. He's preaching baptism of repentance. He's calling the people of Israel to repent. Remember something, the Jews didn't believe they needed to repent. Gentiles had to repent to become Jewish, but he's telling the Jewish people, your hearts are wrong, you're in sin, you need a Savior, he is coming, he is the Messiah, and when he does, you'll need to repent so you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of John was a declaration of all that was coming. It didn't save them, it was preparing them. And she's carrying him, and the moment, the moment Jesus walks in the room as just baby form, what do we see? We see John leaping inside of her. Now to understand what's taking place, this isn't a normal movement of a baby. Moms understand when your baby moves, you know what's going on. I've heard mothers tell me, uh, sit there and saying, they'll be giggling or laughing because their baby has hiccups in the womb. Or, or there's like one of my sons, you'd sit there and, and, and you see an elbow sticking out or a head pop up. Uh, moms understand all that. And Elizabeth's telling Mary, this is not a normal movement. This is something compared to what we see with King David in 2 Samuel 6. It was the Ark of the Covenants being returned into the city of David. Then it happened as the Ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. That's the picture there. That there's this incredible joy so filling the baby inside of Elizabeth that he is leaping and he is dancing. Now here's the incredible thing. It was prophesied at the beginning of Luke, and it's told by the angel Gabriel to Zechariah that John would be filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb of Elizabeth. That's where it took place, right here. That prophecy was fulfilled. Here is John already declaring the forerunner in the very womb of his mother as he's leaping for joy. He's already making a way for the Lord. He's already responding to the Holy Spirit. He's already fulfilling his role as the forerunner. So here he is. We see this immediately, this leaping with joy. But then we see her what? Filled with the Spirit. Automatically, she's filled with Spirit. Now, we've already learned from studying Acts what takes place. Remember Acts 1.8? But you will be receive power. You will become my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the, holy, and, the, and the uttermost parts of the earth. 
Now, we saw what happened when the church was filled with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 2, what do they do? They go out and boldly declare tongues, speaking in known languages. We automatically see that. They're automatically doing that. They're declaring the Word of God with boldness. But then they go on, and what do we see? In chapter uh, chapter uh, 4, we see them going to the temple. They declare boldly before the Sanhedrin. They're threatened and they're released. The church prays for more power to declare boldly. And what happens? The Holy Spirit fills them, and they go out and declare the Word of God with boldness. So notice what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon Elizabeth. She does the exact thing, thing. The baby leaped in her. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 42, in a loud voice, she exclaims. She declares. In other words, she's crying out, almost shouting in sing-song form, declaring that God is blessing everyone. She's blessing Mary. She's blessing Elizabeth. She's blessing every single solitary person. That word declare is associated with speaking divine truth. And so she is automatically declaring what the Spirit's revealing to her. Now notice what's happening here. She knew that Mary was pregnant, but she had no idea that Mary was carrying the Messiah. When the Holy Spirit fills her, he reveals to her that Mary's carrying the Messiah, and she begins to declare, you are blessed among all women. And she begins to make a declaration of God's blessing. Now, guys, if you want to know what this entire song is about, that's what it's about. Blessing, the word is used again and again and again. And we need to understand that word because how we use it and how God uses it, completely different. When blessing refers to us, it all comes from the word eulogia, which we get our word eulogy from. Now, when we hear that, you automatically know what that's associated with, a funeral. All it means is to speak well of or to praise. At a time of eulogy, what do you do? Someone stands up and they speak well of the person who's passed. Now, when we're talking about one another, that's what it means. Now, we shouldn't wait to eulogize someone. We should be speaking well of one another all the time. We should be blessing one another with encouragement. We should be blessing one another with prayer. We should be blessing one another with kind words. We eulogize when we do that. So with one another, we speak that to each other. To God, we do it in praise. We're responding to him and we're giving him what he deserves. Our eulogia, our eulogy, our praise. Now with us, this word, it has to do with us speaking. Now with God, it's completely different. Now, in other words, let me explain this, how God blesses and how we blesses are different. And you need to understand the difference because it makes a complete, this one word, all the blessings that we're going to find from this message hinge on you understanding the concept of God blessing us. So when it's talking about God, it's also talking about God speaking blessing over us. But here's where it's different. There is no way to ever separate God speaking and God acting. They're consistently connected. When God speaks, God acts. If God speaks, God acts. If God speaks something, it happens. We see that with creation. He said, let there be light, there was light. Let me give you an example so you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, The story comes from Mark chapter 6. Jesus has been teaching. He goes off with his disciples. The crowd follows him. He continues to teach them, but it's getting late in the day. The disciples come to him and they say, Jesus, these people got to go get food. Let's go ahead and send them home so they can get home. They're getting hungry. They're getting tired. They're going to be too weak to go off. And Jesus looks at Philip and he goes, Philip, I want you guys to feed them. Well, Philip looks up and goes, whoa, 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 whoa. It's going to cost about 200 denarii to be able to do that. It's half a year's wages. And and they're sitting together and they start strategizing. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do? Andrew shows up with a little boy and he goes, hey, Lord, I got this little guy here. He's got five loaves and two fishes. Can we do anything with that? Jesus says, have everybody sit down. So Jesus takes the five loaves and two fishes. And what's he do? Looking up towards heaven, he blessed the food. Now stop right there. That word blessed is the exact same word, eulogio, that we see right here in Luke chapter 1. Exact same word. He is speaking blessing over it. Remember, when God speaks, he acts. When he speaks, his power is released, he creates. 
He blessed and broke the loaves. He kept giving them to the disciples, and he set before them, and he divided up the two fish among them all. They all ate, all 5,000 men plus women, and were satisfied. In other words, they got enough that everybody was full. And they picked up 12 baskets of the broken pieces and also the fish. There were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. Stop right there and understand what's taking place. If God blesses, God's power is released. When God speaks, he acts. They're intertwined. To be under the blessing of God means that you are under the action of God. Now, to be under God's blessing carries an idea of this. It means to live under his favor. We become the objects of his favor. So if we're going to put it into a definition, it's referring to, God's blessing is referring to his presence. It's referring to his favor. It's referring to his goodness and his joy being bestowed, poured out on you. Now, you need to understand blessing for us to get the meaning of this entire message. When God is blessing you, God is putting into action what he wants to have happen in your life. All of it is to draw you into a closer relationship with him. So the difference is when we speak, we have good intentions, we see something, we honor you with it, we declare something, but we have no power to create anything. I can't say to you, guess what? I'm blessing you with a million dollars unless I have a million dollars I can give you. But when God says it, because he is limitless and he is all powerful, there's nothing that he cannot do in our lives. To be blessed by God, to carry the favor of God, is for God to act in actively with his favor, his goodness, and his joy in our lives. So automatically, we see it, but then we see her declare this blessing. Notice what she says, blessed are you among women. Now, understand what she says here. Be careful. She's saying very clearly that you're blessed are you among all women. Now, she is saying very clearly one thing. Of all the women on earth, you are the most blessed. Now, why? Because in a Hebrew mindset, a mother's identity was largely found through her children. The more significant her children, the more significant the mother's position. And she's telling her, you are the most significant mother because you're having the most important baby. There's no baby more important being born than the baby you're carrying, which is God himself. You're carrying Emmanuel, God with us. He is both human, fully human, and fully God. The first time it's ever happened, the only time it'll ever happen, she goes, you are holding the the hope of all mankind. She goes, you have the greatest favor. So she declares her to be blessed among all women. But then she also goes on to say that she's blessing the fruit of the womb. And blessed is the child you will bear. She's blessing the fruit of your womb. Now understand something. That is a very familiar Old Testament reference. We see it used repeatedly throughout the Old Testament where someone is the fruit of the womb is being blessed. Now, why is that significant? It's because the only time it is used in the entire New Testament is right here, and it only and ever applies to Jesus. They're looking and saying, you are blessed above all women. Blessed are the fruit of your your womb. Why? Because in you is the one and only. Not one among equals. Not one who's the head of the class. You carry the one who's in a class by himself. You carry the one that God himself has exalted and has said that every knee and every tongue will confess that he is the Savior and the Lord of all mankind. You carry the hope for all of us. And she declares that blessing upon Mary. But then something incredible happens. After we see this first song and the declaration of God's blessing, we see the response to the Messiah. We see the first response, or the first to respond to the Messiah. The first respond, the first, I wrote that wrong. It's different in my notes, but let's just go with what I've got on the screen. The first to respond to the Messiah. Now notice something incredible here, guys. This is so important. Notice the very first thing, because the focus shifts from Mary to really to focus upon Jesus. Notice what the thing is. The focus is upon, completely upon him. Notice what she calls him. But why am I so favored that the mother of my 
Lord. Notice what she calls the fruit of her womb. Notice what she calls Jesus, Lord. That phrase is used about a dozen times at the beginning of Luke, and it is always a reference to God. So for her to sit back and say, the fruit of the womb, the baby you're carrying is Lord, she's declaring him to be God. The Holy Spirit's revealed to her, the Messiah that is here, he is fully, 100%, the God of the universe, completely and totally. But notice her response to this. This is so incredible. She says, I, I am so favored. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Listen to the humility there. Uh, who am I that I am graced with the presence of not only the mother of the Savior, but the Savior himself, that you would come into my home? Now, here's the incredible thing. Mary's expecting her own baby. A woman who has been infertile to this point, she has carried a shame of infertility. And in that culture, it could mean that you have been cursed of God. She would be looked down upon. She would have whispers behind her back. She would wear it as shame. And all of a sudden, God has come through, and that has been taken from her. And at her old age, this miracle has happened. Everything the angel said took place. Her child being born is as much a miracle to them as it is to what's happening with Mary, even though Mary's is a greater miracle, but immediately she stops and she says one thing, even though my son is going to be great, yours is greater. Who am I? Who am I that I should at all be allowed in your presence and in his presence? And then she does something incredible. She starts sharing her personal belief in the Messiah. Not just that he's the Messiah, but notice what she says. That the mother of my Lord. She didn't say the Lord. My Lord. See, it's not enough to acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Lord. It's not enough to say, oh yeah, I know he's that. James says himself, it says, you believe there's one God? Good for you. The demons also believe that and they tremble. They know that, and it makes them tremble. She said, it, it, it takes more than you just saying, oh, he's God, tipping your hat, having a fact. There has to be a moment of personal, life-changing belief. And we see how we have that moment of belief, and it's only through one way. It's faith. And the example of that faith is Mary herself. Look what it says, verse 45, blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Notice what she, come, she blesses her for being the mother of the Lord, but then she also blesses her for her faith. She says, blessed because you believe. Believe what? That the promise God has made to you will absolutely be fulfilled. You took God at his word. You trusted God. You banked everything on him and nothing else. See, that's faith. That's faith. See, I need you to understand something. A lot of people call Mary the mother of God. She's not the mother of God. She's the mother of Jesus. God is an eternal being that has existed forever, and Jesus came to earth as a man. Mary was not preexistent. Mary is not eternal. Mary is a woman just like you are. She's human just like we are. She is not the queen of heaven. She has no role in redemption. She does not intercede for man. She does not hear our prayers. We do not need to pray for Mary or pray to Mary. But Mary is an example of faith. Here is a woman who took God at his word, absolutely trusted him, submitted to his will, and we see her joyfully, obediently, worshipfully follow God. What an incredible example. Why? Because we see her personal belief. We see Elizabeth's personal belief. And believe it or not, as Elizabeth, as Elizabeth saying is, he is my Lord, believe it or not, this passage also tells us that he can be your Lord as well. There's a key word here. Notice what it says, blessed is she. She doesn't say blessed is Mary. She doesn't use a singular pronoun. She uses a plural pronoun. Notice what that does. It opens up the conversation, not just to Mary, but to anybody else who's willing to take God at his word. 
Anyone else who's ready to believe in the promise of God, the promise of the Messiah, anyone else who's ready to come and admit that he is the Savior, admit that he is Lord, who's ready to come and admit everything he said about us is true, that we're sinners, that we're separated from God, that we're born thirsty, we're born needing something, we're born empty, and we live our lives instead of coming to God, going to everything else but God, trying to slate that thirst. And we come and we acknowledge that we can't fix that. We can't take that away, that all the things the earth offers and all the things the world promises don't satisfy. Oh, they, they offer some comfort, but they cause more problems than they solve. And we come and we admit we're sinners. And then we believe in what? Him as Savior and Lord, as Messiah. And then we confess that. We come and we tell him, you are my Savior and you are my Lord. It is the greatest act of faith. And it's available to any person alive. Just as Elizabeth, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, said, he is my Lord. You can today as well. You can come and say, I enter this Christmas not just celebrating Christmas. I come celebrating the very heart of Christmas, which is the Messiah, the Christ of Christmas himself, by not just acknowledging him to be Lord, but surrendering to him as Lord and Savior by putting my faith in him. Now, as a result, we get to see the blessing of the Messiah, which is what? It says it right there. Verse 44, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. The one blessing that he wants to talk about that we take away from him today is joy. Joy. Did you know Jesus spent a lot of time talking about joy? Now stop, guys. Remember what blessing is. When God speaks, God acts. When God says, he does. Jesus Christ started in John 15. The last night he's there, he tells the disciples, my joy I give to you, and I give it completely to the fullest. In, in John 16, as they're walking along, he continues to promise them joy, and he tells them, listen, we're going to go through some suffering. We're going to go through some difficulty, but no one can take your joy. And then in John 17, after promising joy, he prays for joy. And listen to what this prayer says. Don't miss what he says. Lord, I pray that they may have the full measure of my joy. Now guess who is praying for? All of us. Every one of us. Remember something. Bless is God speaking and then taking action. And what is his blessing to you today? Joy. If you are his child, one of the greatest gifts he wants to give you of Christmas is joy. But joy is not natural to us. The best we can do as men is happiness. But understand what happiness is. Happiness is getting circumstances in the right order so that all the things outside of us are not causing a distraction, a disturbance, or pain. So for us to be happy, we have to exert a certain amount of control. And if we can control enough stuff, we can get enough stuff in order that we find a moment of happiness. The problem is this. We really can't control anything, can we? You can't control your finances. You can't control your kids. You can't control the economy. You can't control if your favorite team loses, which all of ours did. We can't control any of that. No control. So it almost seems like we're at the whim of society and fate. But joy is different. See, see, joy is not us being controlled or, or trying to control. Joy is us surrendering control. Joy is coming to the realization that there's only one person in control. God. And that, believe it or not, because he loves me and because of his character, I can absolutely trust him. And regardless of what's going on, circumstances don't matter. In the midst of those, I can still look to him and find peace. I can depend on his love. I can depend on his taking situations and working them out, not only for my good, but also for his glory, no matter what that situation is. And when I rest in the midst of that, a peace enters my heart 
where I can find rest. Rest regardless of what's going on. Rest in the face of disease. Rest in the face of death. Rest in the face of all this. Hope beyond that. In the face of my inabilities, my lack, my thirst, my every failure I have, I have a hope that there's coming. That one day when I see Christ, all of that's gone and I'm going to be perfect and sinless. I have that hope. As I watch those around me get sick and die, I have the hope of their salvation, meaning they're going to go to heaven and they're going to be made whole again and we will be reunited and I have hope. When I'm in a circumstance that is out of control, I realize that God can work regardless. He's got it even when I don't understand it. He's working it for something good. And I have hope. And in the midst of that, I can sit down and I can sit back regardless of what's going on and my heart can be at rest. And I can find reason to praise. The point of joy is rejoicing. God, I praise you because you've got this. Joy. What an incredible gift in an unstable world. A consistent God that we can hang on to. Let me say that better word. A consistent God that is hanging on to us. Let me ask you a question. Do you have joy today? Understand what joy isn't. Joy isn't some fake Christian identity where I'm walking in fake smiling. Sometimes joy has a frown on its face. Sometimes joy has tears in its eye. Sometimes joy is facing suffering and sorrow and pain. But at the core of who we are, we know God's in control. We still can find rest in the midst of that. See, that tree, these psalms, those presents, all the, that we do at Christmas, it just scream one thing to you. There is a Savior who is Christ.